the book of Esther, the second chapter, round about verse 15. When you arrive at um, this book, a very peculiar book in the Bible, it stands out uh, all by itself. Uh, But just a snapshot of a few verses that I want to look at. And we're talking about a woman whose name is Esther. There you will find words similar to these. Esther was the daughter of Abihel, who was Mordecai's uncle. Mordecai had adopted his younger cousin, Esther. When it was Esther's turn to go to the king, everybody say king. king. She accepted the advice of Haggai, the eunuch in charge of the harem. She asked for nothing except what he suggested, and she was admired by everyone who saw her. Esther was taken to the king Xerxes at the royal palace in early winter of the seventh year of his reign. And the king loved Esther more than any other young woman. He was so delighted with her that he set the royal crown. Everybody say royal crown. He set the royal crown on her head and declared her queen instead of Vastai. To celebrate this occasion, he gave a great banquet in Esther's honor for all the nobles and officials. Then he also declared a public holiday for the provinces and giving generous gifts uh, to everyone. And all of God's people said together, amen. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, speak to your people today. Open our hearts, our minds, our ears. Allow your seeds to fall on fertile soil. We thank you for what you're going to do, what you're going to speak. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For a moment, I want to talk from the subject. Hashtag relationship goals. Relationship goals. For those of us who don't know, the hashtag goal phenomena uh, is something not fairly new, but it's been around for uh, a little while. Uh, This term is a a term, um, an aspirational term that was birthed on social media, Uh, typically whenever you see the term hashtag, whatever the word is, and goals. It's usually someone um, communicating their aspiration to accomplish this thing or become like whatever it is they see. And all of God's people said, for example, if there are some friends and they're doing something um, adventurous, Someone would put hashtag squad goals, squad goals. If there is a couple of people who are friends and they're doing something that you would like to do, you'll see it on Instagram. You'll see this image and you may put hashtag friend goals or like myself. If you see someone like uh, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, who is in the gym and, you know, he's all handsome and, and, and built and get abs and everything, I might see that image and I might put hashtag life goals, right? Um, uh, it's okay, you can laugh. I said that so you can laugh. It's, it's, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not insecure about it, it's fine. 
may never get there, but it's still life goes. And so you may see uh, Beyonce. Uh, you've never heard of that woman before. And Jay-Z, her husband, and um, they might be doing something. They might be on a yacht. Uh, they may be kissing. They may just look like they're so in love. And you see this image, and some people may put hashtag relationship goals. Similarly, when we think about uh, this hashtag um, phenomena, and we think about goals or relationship goals, when we look at today's text, I think that we see something quite similar. We have a passage that was um, written around 486 BC. You don't have to remember none of that information. We have a king by the name of Xerxes or Ahasuerus. And he is the king of the Persian Empire. And during this time, the Persian Empire was the strongest empire in the entire land. And so he is the Persian king. He is the emperor. And he has 121 provinces that he rules, that he is over, that extends from, from India all the way to uh, Ethiopia. He was very powerful. He had a lot of influence. He had a lot of money. He had a lot of wealth. And everyone was afraid of King Ahasuerus or Xerxes. He was a powerful man. But then we learn when we look at this passage that I have preached or that I have read for you, that there is a woman by the name of Esther. Esther was an orphan. Esther didn't have much. But when we look at this passage, my Bible teaches me that Esther, who was an orphan, had a chance to meet the king. And the king fell in love with her. And he upgraded Esther. So much so that when we read our passage, he falls in love with her. And then the next thing he does is he gives her a crown. Esther has a royal crown. Esther then gets this extravagant, lavish ceremony to honor the fact that she has now become the queen. In addition to that, ladies, as if that wasn't enough, she gets a day to commem commemorate, a holiday to commem commemorate the fact that she has now become the queen in all of Persia. Hashtag relationship goals. I mean, this is a goal, right? I mean, you meet someone and he falls in love with you and then he gives you a crown. Then you're no longer an orphan. You no longer need. You're now upgraded. You have all the wealth, all of the influence. You're now the queen of all of the Persia. And I mean, you get the wedding of your dreams. You get the wedding of your dreams. It was very lavish because we'll learn a little bit about this king. He spends a lot of money. He's into image. He's, he likes to impress. But then that wasn't enough. I'm going to give you a holiday because you are my queen. It's fine. But I know that's relationship goals. But what if I told you that marriage is not a destination. What if I told you that marriage is a journey? Just follow me. Starting off slow, I'm going to get there. What if I told you that there is a problem with the hashtag goals? Because you or me or we tend to attach our hope and our desires to an image without knowing the details or the behind the scenes. I back up, y'all act like y'all don't know what's going on. Okay, so we're on Instagram. 
we're on Facebook and then we see that image of that couple or we see that image of that person who is doing the traveling or we see that image and it seems like there's so much happiness and we begin to overlook where we are and we want that image. Hashtag goals. There is a danger in attaching ourselves to images of other things and other people when we don't fully know the behind the scenes. Because, because when we take another look at this passage, we take another look at this passage and we begin to not just focus on that one image, the one image that captivates our attention when we say we want a crown, I want a wedding, I, I, I want a holiday, I want an Isaac Curry holiday. I would love these things, but what if I encouraged you not to attach yourselves to an image but to also consider that everything is not what it always seems. What if I say, okay, okay. Although we begin reading at verse 15, why don't we stop and consider that there's a verse 1 through 14? And before we attach ourselves to the image of verse 15 through 18, why don't I remind you that there is a chapter 1? And so instead of attaching myself to the image of what I see and what I want to become, let me hold my horses and say, let me do a little bit investigation. Because what I see initially is a woman who is chosen by a man. What I see initially is a woman who is given a crown and given power and given influence. What I see is a woman who gets a holiday and is happy and now has the wedding, now has the ceremony. She is she has everything she ever wanted. That's what I see. But let's take our time. Because when we look a little further, we'll discover that this king, Ahasuerus, or Xerxes, was a king who was into opulence. He loved to look like he had a whole lot, which he did. He loved for people to be impressed with what he had. He was always in the business of pleasing other people. He had so much wealth. He loved for everyone to see what he had. I'm talking about the king. The king had wealth. And he spent his wealth lavishly on so many different things. I'm saying, when we look at this passage, we discover in chapter 1 that there was so much wealth in his third year, he decided that he wanted to host a banquet for, that lasted 180 days. So for six months throughout the entire, entire province, the entire Persian empire, everyone was released from work and everyone was indulging in this party for six entire months. It was so wonderful that he passed a law that said everyone had to drink. As a matter of fact, you have to out drink me. He passed this law and they, they drinking out of gold and goblets. There was so much, so many different things in this empire that he spent and he just wasted money. But then, but then we keep on looking, we keep on looking that after 180 days and after this banquet, he hosted a second banquet for seven days. And, and for seven days, it was just for the, for, for the citizens. And for seven days, he holds this banquet. And one of the customs, I have to give you this information, but one of the customs in the Persian Empire is that when the men are at the banquet, when everyone has to eat together, but when the men begin to drink, the women have to leave. And so in chapter one, they are having this banquet. Everyone is here, wives and husbands. But when the men began to drink, the wives had to leave. And what we don't understand or we don't realize is that although we're looking at chapter two, verses 15 through 18, when we look in chapter one, we discover that there was a queen and her name was Vastai. 
And she was the queen and Xerxes was the king. But when they when they began to drink and the queen Vashti left, she went to be with the women. And so the Bible teaches us when you do this for homework and you begin to read, you'll discover one thing that while she was in the other building, the other side of the palace and she was with the women, the, the men had gotten so drunk. The Bible says that the king was so intoxicated and so merry and so high in spirits because of the wine that he was drinking, he petitioned for the men or for the servants to go and get his queen. And then he said, tell her to come because I want to show her off to all of the nobles. I want to show her off to all of these high ranking officials. And then he said something else. Tell her to bring her crown and wear it on her head. And the Bible says that Vastai refused. And when she refused to come so that she could walk around so the men could now see her beauty because the king was only into people affirming him. He was only into showing off the things that he had. And so when she refused, all of his advisors who were around him began to look at him. And when they began to look at him, he became infuriated with with he was he was filled with rage, the Bible says. And then he began to listen to his advisors. It says he listened to his advisors and said, what should we do? What should what, what should I do? And the Bible says that he listens to his advisors, the people around him. And so they convinced him that you need to divorce her. I'm going to tell you why you need to divorce Vastai, because if if she can tell you no, then the other women discover that she had the audacity to tell you no. Then throughout the entire Persian Empire, you're going to have men, women who are going to stand up to men and tell them no. And so we need to do something about her because we can have a woman speaking up saying no. And so the, the, the advisors, I'm going somewhere with this. I'm just trying to build my case. So the advisors around him said, listen, this is what you need to do, King. You need to pass a law that you cannot revoke. You need to pass a law that says that she is banished. She can no longer see you. You have nothing to do with her. Pass it now so that we can let the women know that you cannot say no to the men. The men can say whatever they want and do whatever they want. And you have to accept it. Read your chapter one. And so and so and so the thing is, if we press reverse, why would she say no? I'll tell you why. Because when he asked for his wife, the queen, to come in and to and to walk around so that the other nobles can begin to see her beauty, the Bible says he emphasized, but tell her to wear her crown. How can I word this? So when he told her to wear her crown, it was um, equal to when a man may tell a woman to just wear your red pumps. (laughs) Not that it that didn't translate to everyone. So this is just. (laughs) So he's drunk. He's high in spirits. And then. While he's intoxicated, he tells the the servants to go and get Vashti and tell her to come because I want to show her off. I want to show the men her beauty, but tell her to wear her crown. The crown has nothing to do with beauty. The crown represents status. But he wants her to wear the crown because that's the only thing he wants her to wear. And so when he's telling her to come and to wear the crown, he's telling her to parade around the nobles naked so that they can see your beauty. I'm going to sit there right there. And so the wife, the queen, Vastai says, I'm not going to do that. But when I think about this, I I, I, want to believe that this isn't the first encounter that Vastai had with her husband. I want to believe that this is the first time that he gotten drunk and he gotten belligerent and, and this is her being fed up. And so when he asked for her and he asked her to come around and to walk around and to parade around naked so the other men, the other nobles can see her. She said, no, I'm not going to do that. And when she said no, it showed him to be powerless. 
And so that's why he was, his ego was hurt. And so as a result, not because she did something evil. Now, granted, we are in a different culture. But I'm trying to transcend cultures because I got a point to share with you. I'm fully aware of what the culture is. But she, hey, she, she, she now has a voice and she now speaks up. But when she does, he decides that that's a problem. And his people around him decided that they were going to get him to divorce her. And so then when he separates himself from Vastai, this is when, again, his people around him create this outlandish process. This outlandish process of trying to find another queen included this. King, I'm going to tell you what, you go ahead and banish her. But when you banish her, we'll find you another queen. This is how we're going to find you another queen. He said, I'm listening. And, and he said, okay, we're going to go into all of the provinces and we're going to find the most beautiful women. And when we find the beautiful women, we're going to bring them into one place. A harem, H-A-R-E-M is what we read. This harem is a building, a room, a house where all of the concubines would live. And so he says, we're going to bring them all into uh, the harem and we're going to keep them for 12 months. For one whole year, we're going to give them beauty treatments. They can't see you until we fix them up. They, they can't see you until we make sure that we have all of the special ointment, all of the fragrances, all of the perfume. We want to make sure that they're just right for you. We want to make sure that they know who you are and how to impress you. And that's going to take one whole year. And, and we're going to do that for one whole year, King. And then when we do that, we're going to give them an opportunity after 12 months. We're going to give them one day, one night to please you. And after that, right, if she can please you and you like her more than the others, then guess what? That'll be your queen. So before I give you a crown, I need you to dress up for me. Before I give you a crown, I need to make sure you fit my appetite. And then if she fits or satisfies your appetite, king, then you can give her the crown. This is what his advisors convinced him to do unpause and so now there's a woman named Esther and we enter into a chapter two yes Esther was chosen but she was chosen to be someone else's replacement so I, I, I'm trying to get to the hashtag goals because if we just look at chapter 2, verses 15 through 18, and we want to have the crown, we want to have the lavish ceremony, and we want to have a, a, a holiday to celebrate the marriage and, and becoming queen or king, I'm just saying, let's uncover the behind the scenes and the details because it's not always as, as, you, as, as, as you think. And so, and so after... 12 months, this, this, this woman named Esther, she comes in to the harem and for 12 months, she gains favor with the people, Haggai, and she does everything that he tells her to do. And, and when it comes to the day that she has to go into the king, the Bible says they're given the opportunity to take something, one object, something in with them, whatever they can do to perform tricks, whatever they got to do to just make the king satisfied. And the Bible says that she didn't take anything with her. I'm not going to do any commentary on that. And so she goes in. One night after 12 months, she wasn't preparing for the marriage. She was preparing for the ceremony. She was preparing to be chosen. And so she goes in and something happens that night. She had enough tricks. She had been trained well. Whatever happened, the process is after that night, they move from the first harem into the second harem and into the second harem are all of the official concubines and they have to stay there. And if the king asks for you by name, then you get to leave that harem and you get to be with him. But everyone who is not chosen, they have to remain in that harem for the rest of their lives and no one gets to see them anymore. 
And so she's in the second harem after the, the morning after. And then the Bible says that he chose her. But I need you to understand. Don't auction your crown for a clown. Your crown is far worth more. But if you feel you got to perform just to be chosen, you're in the wrong place. Don't auction your crown to a clown. Hashtag relationship goals. I mean, we want chapter 2, verse 15 through 18, but we don't want the verse 1 through 14. Because when we look at this passage... And we, we, we recognize now that everything is far greater and it's different and it's a little bit more sticky than what we see in verse 15, 7, 16, 17 and 18. I'm saying there were some mistakes that were made. And so I'm here to help you. There's some mistakes. There were some mistakes. Number one, the first mistake that was made. They prepared for the wedding and forgot about the marriage. They prepared for the wedding. And they forgot about the marriage. A lavish ceremony does not equal a happy marriage. A lavish wedding ceremony does not necessarily mean you're going to have a happy marriage. I don't care how many groomsmen, how many bridesmaids. I don't care how many wedding registries you have. I don't care where you have the wedding. Don't confuse your wedding with your marriage. But something else, I mean, just even, even when fifth day is that don't bench God just to start your husband. I'm, 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 I'm making, I'm, uh, don't put God on the bench just to start your wife. It's a sport analogy. When you're playing sports, you're playing sports. Everyone wants to be in the starting lineup. Everyone wants to be the first people out on the court. Everyone wants to be the first people out on the field. Everyone wants to be the first chosen. But I'm saying to you in this scenario, it's not worth putting God on the bench just to start the man or the woman you think you want. What are you saying? When we look at this passage, when we look at this chapter, when we look at this book, not one time do we see or hear a prayer. Not one time do we see or witness a sacrifice. Not one time is, is, is anyone referring to God, neither mentioning the name of God. There is no Mosaic law mentioned as a matter of fact she is eating she is living just like a gentile and she is a jew she has totally assimilated her life into his because i want the crown number two I got to get this done because I got to, yeah, yeah, never mind. Disregard that. Number two. I was talking out loud, sorry. She focused on impressing him while simultaneously suppressing herself. She focused for 12 months. She focused on impressing him while simultaneously suppressing herself. What do you mean? You will look at the passage, you will look at the text, and it will say that while she was going through her beauty treatments, she still was not revealing her true identity because she was taught by her uncle to not make sure that you don't tell them who you really are. Make sure you don't tell them where you come from. And so while she's preparing to impress the king, she's at the same time suppressing who she really is. And many times we will find ourselves in a situation where we're jumping through hoops 
trying to impress someone at the same time showing them our representative. She's spending her time impressing or trying to impress him and learn about him and he knows nothing about her. He's not spending his time trying to get to know her. He's just waiting for her to come in that night and see if she got what it takes to to join the team. Don't allow your crown to become an ornament of oppression. All this she did so that she can still suppress who she really was. I know you understand the book of Ezra or something else, but I'm looking at this from the the aspect from the lens of relationships. Because she spent all of her time preparing for him and he never prepared for her. I'm saying it was imbalanced. Number three. They allowed sideline spectators to referee their relationship. And whenever you allow the people on the sideline to dictate what's going on in your relationship. You'll never have a relationship. Because the people who have access to your ears help to shape your thoughts. Your appetite is going to always be influenced by your association. And so when you have people and the people you have in your circle, those are the people that help shape your thoughts. And I'm saying the advisors were the ones that told him you need to leave her and you need to go ahead and find another queen. And we'll help you find this queen through this outlandish process. But he listened to them. They allow sideline spectators to referee their relationship. Number four, last number four, number four. The mistake that they made. Sex was the barometer to determine whether or not they were compatible. Oh, see, nobody say nothing. I, I, I get you. I get you. It's fine. Which means I need to stay right there. Sex was the barometer to determine whether or not they were compatible. Sex was what was used to determine whether or not we're going to go any further. And if you cannot last in bed or if you cannot please me the way I like to be pleased, if you cannot hit my spot, if you cannot, I'm sorry, we got any children in here, forgive me. If you cannot satisfy me, then I, I know we can't get married. I'm saying the mistake they made was that they used sex to determine whether or not they were compatible. Let's not, regardless of what you believe or your faith, regardless of where you're from, regardless of how you use or think or view money, regardless of whether or not you're emotionally or spiritually mature, none of that matters if we cannot um, click in the bedroom. That was the mistake that they made. But let me help you. Your sex won't cure his dysfunction. You just need to know this. I'm going to tell you because nobody else will tell you. I'm going to tell you right now. Your sex. Y'all be telling me I can talk real. So so don't be sending me emails and stuff. (laughs) Your sex will not cure his dysfunction. Because you're so focused on getting the crown. Because you're so focused on getting the holiday. So you're so focused on working on the ceremony that you don't even know he got anger issues. You don't know know he got a wandering eye. You don't know that he's extremely selfish. And he's filled with pride because you're focusing on the crown. But when you finish... And when you come off of the honeymoon, he's going to still be dysfunctional even after you leave that bed. I'll translate it. A ring won't cure infidelity. And wedding vows won't cure a lustful spirit. Because if you have a lustful spirit as a single person. Guess what? 
even after you get married, you still going to have a lustful spirit. There is no magic in the wedding ring. I'm sorry. So you give me these four things, you tell me these four things, and you tell me these four things, four mistakes that they made. So, so what are you saying? I am saying if it was a perfect world, this is what she should have done, or this is what we can do. One thing, five words, five words that will bless your life. Let me know you're ready for the five words. Just trying to make sure I got the five words. <laughs> Show me your Carfax report. <laughs> Show me your Carfax report. Just follow, 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 follow me, follow me, follow me. Y'all laughing. I'm serious. I'm serious. Y'all laughing. Show me your Carfax report. I know everybody does. I can't assume everybody knows what Carfax is. I, I get that. I get that. Show me your Carfax report. Because if you show me your Carfax report, I will discover how many owners this vehicle has had. Oh, I don't want no who's right now. I, I'm, I'm focused. And, 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 and there is a school of thought that says, I don't care about the past. I get it. You ain't got to care about the past, but I don't come from that school of thought. Don't be judged by my past. Don't judge my past, but I have the right to know about the past because I want to purchase this car with my eyes wide open. I don't want to go into the car lot and I don't want to look at the outward, uh, uh, look at how shiny this vehicle is. And then you, you sell me this outlandish price for this car and then I pay and then I don't look under the hood only to leave the car lot. And then now the car is giving me more trouble than it's worth. Because I didn't want to ask questions. I didn't want to offend anybody, but he's selling a car or she's selling a car and I got the money and I got the right before I give you my money. I want to know about the history of the car that I'm trying to purchase. How many wrecks have you had? <laughs> Whose fault was it? Did you go to a regular uh, neighborhood mechanic to get the car fixed or did you go to the manufacturer? Because when you go to the manufacturer, the manufacturer will make sure that you get the right parts and it's done right. You're going to pay more, but it's going to be done right. But if you go to the neighborhood mechanic, you still going to be, I can't use janky because you don't know what janky means. But you, you still, you still, you still going to be dysfunctional. The car still going to be dysfunctional. It's only other. Esther, that was her culture, her situation. But for you, you need to ask for the Carfax report. And if the person on the car dealership on the car lot does not want to give me the Carfax report, then that lets me know enough I need to know. Because for me, yeah, yeah, I got the Jeep Wrangler, right? I already been in two wrecks already. That kind of fender bender. One was my fault, the other one wasn't. But I don't mind showing you the Carfax report, though. Now, knowing I've been in two wrecks, one was my fault, the other one wasn't. If you don't want to purchase the car, then that's on you. I'm sorry. Because before the ceremony that you're focusing on, Esther, you need to be asking the question, uh, why do you want me to be your queen? What happened to your former queen? Or, or how many queens did you have? All right, y'all get the point. So if you really want to know what real relationship goals are, real relationship goals are this. Number one, when you have equal voice and vision in your relationship. When you have equal voice and vision in your relationship. Your voice is just as important as her voice. Your voice is just as important as his voice. When you have equal voice and vision, you contribute just as much as the other person contributes to your. That's real relationship goals. Real relationship goals is when when I open my mouth, I say something it may not sound as educational as or as sophisticated as you make it sound. But uh, is it just as important as when you open your mouth? I'm saying equal voice and vision. Second thing, when you 
are valued for something other than your beauty and your body. Yeah, body. Because I, I could not come up with that word to save my life. I had the other word, but I didn't think that that would have been, you know. But anyway, so yeah. Yeah, if you are, I was trying to keep the alliteration. When you are valued for something other than your beauty and your body. Thank you. When real relationship goals is when you can say, what do you like about me beyond my beauty? And you can get an answer. Number three, when your life is not forecast for everyone to see. Real relationship goals is when you learn Facebook and Instagram don't need to know everything going on in your relationship. Real relationship goals, King, is when you don't have to ask those those people around you, what do I need to do in my own marriage? When you got the echo chamber and everything they say you do. And so now the people on the outside who don't know what it's like to be on the inside, the people who single, given the person who is his married advice and they ain't got no husband or no wife. I'm saying to you. I'm saying that. Your relationship doesn't need to be forecast for everyone to see. And the last one. Real relationship goals. Is when your relationship draws you closer to God instead of further away from God. Real relationship goals is when you can look over your life. You see the praying. You see the sacrifices. You see the dialogue. You see your spiritual walk is better. You don't have to assimilate into his life and sacrifice who you are. You don't have to suppress any of these things. But God is in the center, woven in the fabric of your relationship, real relationship goals. But guess what? You can't see that when you just look at chapter 2, verses 15 through 18. You can't see that when you see the image on social media. And so you're signing up to something that you don't realize you really don't want. Not all, just some or most. Hashtag relationship goals. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you um, for your word. We thank you for your blessings, your life, your love, for the Holy Spirit. We thank you for the book of Ezra and what she has to teach us. And God, we're praying that your seeds have fallen upon good ground, that your children will hide your words in their hearts so that the enemy cannot steal, steal them when we walk from this place. Bless us, breathe on us as we begin to listen and participate uh, in worship. Bless us, God, as we begin to allow your spirit to speak through us through song. Thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.